In today's sample lecture, we are going to look at some linguistic facts provided by the Slavic family. One may immediately wonder by just looking at the title, what do sentience and being alive, to wit animacy, and the state of manly vigor and spirit, that is virility, have to do with linguistics? As it turns out, both animacy and virility are grammatical categories in the Slavic languages. That is to say, the nouns in the Slavic family, uh, in the Slavic languages, are classed according to whether they denote all animals, including humans, male animals, male humans, or inanimate objects. An introduction to this system is the focus of today's exposition. But before we dive into the topic, we do need to define a few things and agree on a few conventions. The first of this concerns cases. Slavonic languages, apart from Bulgarian and Macedonian, have morphological cases. Of interest to us are nominative, accusative, and genitive. Consider this sentence, where the goblin is the entity that does the devouring. It is the subject of the sentence. The bat is the unfortunate victim of the monster's gluttony. It is the entity being acted upon. That is to say, it is a direct object. Now these functions, namely the function of a subject and that of a direct object, are encoded on the nouns themselves. Subjects appear in the nominative case, while objects appear in the accusative case. To make this a little more explicit, consider this example from one of the South Slavic languages, Croatian, Serbian, and Bosnian. The word machka is the subject in A. It is in the nominative case, and this is the form that is cited in the dictionary. Now compare machka in the direct object position in sentence B. Here the cat is in accusative which is encoded by the case ending U. The second point that is necessary for our discussion concerns gender. Slavonic nouns, just like the nouns in a variety of European languages, are specified for gender. And for the most part, you can tell what gender a given noun is by just looking at the shape of its ending. Bosnian Serbian Croatian is cited here once again. Stol, table, Muškarac, man, Ivan, a gentleman named Ivan, and pas, dog, all end in a consonant. Furthermore, Ivan and Muškarac refer to male humans. So all these words belong to, uh, ma to the masculine set. Feminines like Kniga and Jelena and in a, and neuters and in o or a. Now each gender includes a variety of concrete and abstract nouns, as well as animates and inanimates. Now with these preliminaries out of the way, let us now turn to the main point of today's lecture. We are going to look at the way Slavic encodes animacy and virility. So what is animacy? It is a category that subsumes all animals and humans. Virility must strike you as a funny term. Now, if you're thinking it has to do with blokes, you are precisely right. Virility, or masculine personal as it is sometimes called, characterizes a class of nouns that refer to male humans, but not animals. As we will see shortly, different Slavic languages treat their nouns differently. Some encode animacy, some encode virility. We're going to look at three different languages from each Slavonic branch. Polish is our West Slavic representative. From the East Slavic branch, we have Russian and Serbian Croatian from the South Slavic branch. It is necessary to keep in mind that the discussion here concerns strictly the nominative and accusative case positions. 
and for ease of exposition, we will confine our attention to subjects and direct objects. For the latter, we, uh, we discuss both singular and plural objects, and we also consider plural subjects. All three languages under discussion mark their masculine singular animate objects in a special way. Consider this sentence. John is a direct object. It is masculine. The word itself ends in a consonant and refers to a male. It is animate. It denotes a sentient being. And it is singular. Now, all three Slavic languages encode this by the ending you see on the direct object. And it is distinct from the nominative case ending, but syncretic with or identical to the genitive case ending. Now, we haven't discussed genitive as it is not particularly crucial for present purposes. What is important is that an object like John is distinct from an object like magazine. So, Jennik, Journal, and Chasopis are all masculine and singular, but also inanimate. And the shape of these words in the accusative will be identical to the shape of these words in nominative. In other words, in all three languages, singular masculine animate objects have a special form. And so, Jack, Vladimir, Dog, a male Brit, a male criminal, Santa Claus, male fool, and crocodile will all have this special accusative form that is syncretic with genitive in all three languages. And this distinguishes these masculine anima animates from the inanimate masculines like table and journal. The words woman and book are feminine. Now, they do have an accusative case marking, but the morphology does not encode animacy. In other words, it is immaterial whether a feminine noun is animate or not. Russian demonstrates this pattern nicely. Crocodile, Vladimir, and Toaster are all masculines. And one can glean this from the morphological shape of these nouns in the nominative case. They all end in a consonant. And the fact that Vladimir refers to a male human. Now, the accusative forms of crocodile and Vladimir are distinct from the accusative form of toaster. Uh, only the former two, namely crocodile and Vladimir, belong to the set of animates and are marked with this special form syncretic with genitive. Feminines, girl, uh, Natasha, book, and car have the same accusative morphology that is distinct from nominative morphology. Now, of course, we know that uh, girl and Natasha denote animate beings, but girl and Natasha have the same form of the accusative ending as the inanimate feminines, namely book and car. And so, uh, by way of quick summary here, we can conclude that all three of our Slavic languages um, have a special way to mark singular objects, provided that these singular objects are masculine and animate. Our second context implicates plural, plural objects, and this is where our three languages are distinct. We begin with a simple, simple sentence. Now, we know that a verb like praise in the Slavic languages as well as English requires a direct object. Now, here's a range of possible objects that are pertinent for our purposes, for our languages. Anna praised the cats. Um, the entity cats is animate. 
but not virile. That is because it does not include any human males. By contrast, professors is classed as animate and virile so long as the set of professors include at least one human male. Finally, an object like books is neither. It is not animate because books have no circulatory or respiratory systems. They don't ambulate or wreak havoc in your backyard. Obviously, they're not virile either, so they belong to the set of inanimates. Now then, in Russian, professors and cats are clustered together. They're animate and bear a special form in the accusative case. Polish has a special form for professors that is distinct from the form used for cats, women, and books. Finally, our third language, Serbian and Croatian, does not have a special form for males, humans, or animals. In other words, plural direct objects have a special form in the following situations. In Russian, all animate plural entities are special. The set includes nouns like women, dogs, Brits, students, crocodiles, and horses, but excludes nouns like computers, chimneys, dances, dichotomies, and airplanes. In Polish, the special form of accusative is reserved for plural entities that contain at least one male human. So Brits, students, and professors will appear in the special form as long as this plural set includes at least one human male. Now this language does have exclusively feminine forms, think actor versus actress. Of course, if you wanted to put actresses in the accusative case in Polish, you have to use the non-virile form. And actresses share this form with books, crocodiles, and garden implements. Finally, in Croatian and Serbian, there is no special form for animates or entities that include guys. So Brits, students, dogs, women, sofas, all have the same ending in the accusative plural. In fact, we can conceptualize the distinction in the following way. Let us imagine we have a set of plural entities in the world. Our South Slavic representative does not care whether those plural objects are alive or not, nor whether they have a human penis. On the other hand, Russian divides its plurals into those that breathe and those that don't. The former set enjoys a special accusative form. Finally, Polish is even more picky from the set of animate plurals. It marks a special those that, in, uh, those that uh, include an entity with specific biological equipment. So at this point, you may be wondering about the subjects. It needs to be kept in mind that the ensuing discussion applies only to plural subjects. The generalization here is straightforward. While Russian and Serbian creation do not have a special form for marking their nominative plurals, Polish does. And once again, uh, plural entities um, that include a human male are in the privileged position. But believe it or not, this is not even the full story. In fact, Polish plural subjects have a three-way distinction. The honorific virile is reserved for nouns like astronomers, Scots, bolts, kings, plus all the first and last names. Here's our example, Baltove, bolts, the denizens of the Baltic states. Then there is the neutral virile with some of the examples like Englishmen, Poles, singers, butchers, and students. Our example is studenci, students. Finally, there is deprecatory non-virile, which is used for horse thieves, cabs, 
bastards, and a bunch of unpleasant slurs. Our example is coniocrade, horse thieves. Now, needless to say, horse thieves, cads, bastards share something in common with kings, students, and butchers. Namely, they all include human males. Yet by sharing the endings used for fem female humans, animals, and inanimate objects, they encode this derogatory sense. In fact, certain words may appear with all three endings. Take the word professors, for instance. If you wish to convey a particular degree of deference, you'll use the honorific virile, professorove. If your sentiment is neutral, then you may choose the form professorji. Now, if you're really upset with your professor and believe that they have no business of teaching, you may resort to this de deprecatory form professore. The morphological systems that we've touched upon ever so briefly in this session emerged as a result of historic development of these languages. One may reasonably ask now, why is it that the masculine entities play such a prominent role in the grammars of these languages? Though an exhaustive answer to this question really transcends the scope of this lecture, I am going to leave you with one interesting um, tidbit that is to do with the historic trajectory of Slavonic nouns. On the screen, you see the late Proto-Indo-European and common Slavic reconstructions of the words horse, which is masculine, and woman, which is feminine in two cases, nominative and accusative. And as a quick aside here, common Slavic is the ancestor language of all contemporary Slavic languages. Okay, back to our reconstructions. While in Proto-Indo-European, the forms of accusative and nominative are distinct for both of these declensional types, um, in common Slavic, Various sound changes led to the syncretism of nominative and accusative for masculine nouns. In other words, there is no distinction in the morphological shape of horse nominative, that is the subject, and horse accusative, that is the object. Note that the feminines in accusative have always been distinct from the feminines in nominative. So, could it be that these Slavic languages developed a new way to mark those unremarkable uh, forms of masculines from common Slavic in order to disambiguate the function of these nouns in a sentence? This, in fact, was one of the earliest hypotheses expressed by the scholars working on the Slavonic languages. Suppose that your language looks like A, with no morphological way to distinguish nominative from accusative, which is precisely the situation that we saw in common Slavic. Now, we may rely on word order to identify the functions of nominal expressions in the sentence. But what if, but what if your language does this? What if it scrambles the position of your object and your subject? Now, in situations like B, C, and D, it is pretty hard to tell who is doing the watching and who is being watched, right? Now, one way to solve this is simply to mark the accusative with a distinct form in order to disambiguate the grammatical uh, functions, subject and object. Now, it should be noted here that the problem does not arise for a typical object like apple. It is vastly more plausible that the man is the seer of the apple rather than the other way around. 
Therefore, there is no need to mark apple with a special form. Recall now that feminines like jeanna, woman, from a slide before, already had a way to identify their function. After all, their ending in the accusative has been distinct from nominative throughout the history of Slavic. Now, the important point that I would like to make here is that this account, though intuitively compelling, compelling may be insufficient to explain just how masculines and animus acquired this prominent role in the grammars of our languages. Now, there are certain morphological and semantic factors that we couldn't touch upon in this lecture, but I hope you may choose to investigate those on your own. And for further readings, I endorse the following sources. The first one deals with a variety of language issues, not necessarily Slavic specific, but of interest to an aspiring linguist. And the second source contains descriptions of all Slavonic languages.